Welcome everyone. This is our fourth class in our sustainable yard care series. Um, and this class is all about creating habitat for beneficial wildlife in your yard. And this is the first time we've offered this particular topic. So I'm personally really excited about it. Um, so I'm not delivering the talk, I am the facilitator. Uh, my name is Kristen Covey and I work for the King County Wastewater Treatment Division and I'm an educator. I normally teach about wastewater and stormwater, so um, that is my expertise. Um, but today we have two wonderful speakers. We have Sarah Rosero from the Snohomish Conservation District and she's a new speaker to the series, so I'm really excited to have her here today. Um, and we also have someone who's been graciously sharing her knowledge with us for years <laughs> since the beginning of the series, uh, Monica Vanderburen from the King County um, Wastewater Treatment Division. So she's back again. Um, thank you both for being here. Um, so before I pass it over to them, I'm going to provide a little context for the series. Um, for those of you who are new today, if you've seen this already, um, I am giving you full permission, I don't usually say this as a teacher, um, to tune out for a minute or two. So, um, but yes, if you're new, welcome. And um, the Snohomish Conservation District and the King County Wastewater Treatment Division have been partnering on this series now for um, six years. And the, the initial reason why we started partnering was because of a place called Brightwater. Um, it's King County's newest wastewater treatment plant and it was constructed, it is constructed, um, just across the King County border in Snohomish County. And so we're serving both King County and Snohomish County residents um, and there's also uh, which is kind of unique, an education and community center that was constructed as part of the project. Um, so it made perfect sense for us to partner because we share community members, we share an interest in improving water quality, and then we have a physical space for people to gather together. So this is normally where we hold these classes um, at this education center. And then I'll bring your attention up to the the box here. We only have one more left. So our next class is on March 6th, which is in two weeks at 10 o'clock. And um, this class will be focused on um, how to manage nuisances and pests in your yard. And this is also a new topic for us. So that should be exciting. All right. And then just briefly, um, the King County Wastewater Treatment Division is made up of 650 employees um, who are all dedicated to providing a system to clean wastewater and water for everyone that lives in this service area. Um, so we operate three large regional treatment plants, including Brightwater up here, um, that serve 1.8 million people, including 17 different cities. So. We have a lot of work to do and obviously our our main focus is cleaning water um, but we also want to provide educational opportunities to support um, the communities we serve and one way we we do that one small way is by offering um, these classes to help support a healthy environment so um, that's us and um, just to transition and tell you a little bit more in terms of logistics um, we're hoping that we'll be able to leave about 15 minutes at the end of um, Sarah and Monica's talk for questions. So Sarah and Monica will be kind of co-presenting for a little over an hour, we're hoping. Um, but while they're presenting, feel free to use the chat box to um, ask questions as they're presenting. And the person that's not actually talking will do their best to try to answer them. So they will be very busy and multitasking. Um, if we miss any questions, um, don't fret because I'm gonna keep track of any questions that didn't get answered in the chat box and we'll address them at the end of the talk. So um, I think that's all I have. I'm so excited for this presentation and um, I'm going to stop sharing my screen so that Monica can start hers. Okay, um, so Sarah, you're on first. Perfect. So we all are here today to talk about landscaping for wildlife. So we're going to be talking about habitat at home, 
what is habitat, really defining that for folks, and then ways to incorporate it at your house and at your property. So I work for Snohomish Conservation District. I've been with the district in different capacities for about three years now. Um, my background is really, I had, Why we political, can't do on? I had political aspirations um, when I was younger. So I joined the military thinking that would boost my political career. Um, and then, you know, I served five years, kind of figured out it wasn't really for me. It wasn't my passion. It wasn't what was driving me each day. And so I went back to college and got my degree and then started working in conservation. So something that really aspires me and is aspiring and something that I try to incorporate um, weekly or into my daily life is really data collection through citizen science. So this could be done through eBird, reporting birds that you've seen, um, iNaturalist, really reporting some amphibians and whether it's plants, insects, there's a way to really collect that information to be used for science. And I will introduce myself. I'm Monica. Um, I have introduced myself as a wastewater treatment division employee uh, several times in recording, so you don't need to hear me again. I, I always do like to tell our beginning gardeners I am literally the poster child for anybody can garden. I grew up in inner city Chicago and didn't really start to garden until I purchased a piece of property on the Snohomish River. Um, and I am very much into wildlife. So um, I actually do these classes as a volunteer, not a King County employee, believe it or not. Um, and I've done this for a number of agencies for years. I'm a native plant steward. Um, and so everything I do, including online multimedia, is literally volunteering. Um, there's a link on here I just did. We had a backyard bird challenge last year. And so I was taking a lot of photos of my neighborhood wildlife and then wildlife near me and posted it online to kind of inspire people um, to really get involved in birding. It's been a big pursuit um, during the pandemic. So, so that's kind of who I am. And I am going to uh, now just cruise into the sort of high level, why build habitat, right? Wildlife has places to live, we're fine, right? Not really. So I'm gonna take you really far away to the Arctic. I went there on a trip a few years ago. And this is up on Baffin Island. It is technically a polar desert. It is very much shaped by wind and ice. So glaciers once scraped through this area. Um, there really isn't a whole lot of snow. There are no trees. Everything that does grow here is really small. And what you see is that even though this has a painfully short summer, any place that you can get wildlife habitat, all of a sudden you have wildlife. So there, unfortunately, the caribou are gone from over hunting, but there was a caribou herd. There are hares, there are raptors that come in, marine life, insects, and this is a really harsh place. Well, actually, that's exactly what happened in uh, Western Washington. I'm sure even for our folks in London, there used to be a lot of habitat where in this place. And then we came along and we needed to make places for us to live, to work, to go to school. And so we started to do exactly what the glaciers did in Baffin Island, which is take apart the landscape and then occupy it. Um, the good news is that, especially in our area, I can't speak for our UK folks, but um, we have along the western seaboard this whole Pacific Flyway where we have a lot of wildlife coming back and forth from Central and South America, and then from as far north as the Arctic looking for homes. We have a lot of resident wildlife. So if we can start to put back some of that habitat on our own properties, we have a very changed landscape like Baffin Island did after the last ice age, but we can actually welcome wildlife home. And the, we, as Kristen said, we're very much about wastewater and stormwater. We're a clean water agency. 
What's really important for us is that if you are creating a really healthy habitat for wildlife in your backyard, it's also healthy for you. It's healthy for your pets. And guess what? All the stormwater coming off of your yard is going to be cleaner for wildlife that's far away. And likely as not, if you have natural yard care practices like we've been talking about in this series, you're going to have less runoff that's going into our waterways. So that's kind of the big picture of why should we build habitat and I'm going to turn it back over to Sarah to talk about what habitat is. Thanks Monica. Yes so habitat how are we defining this? Well for us we are going to be talking about the four basic elements. Um, so before we get into that we can kind of Monica shared this analogy with us and I am going to use it here but credit her. Um, if you're providing things mainly like bird feeders and you don't maybe have a lot of native plants or not a lot of layers in your yard in terms of plants, um, it's almost equating it to raising your children in a grocery store. You can imagine, like they have all the food they need possible, right? It's stocked, lots of choices possibly, um, but they don't really, it doesn't really house anything else for their development and growth and maybe no sleeping areas, maybe no places to play and hang out. Um, and that is just not really what we're trying to do with our properties, right? We want to offer um, everything that is going to be beneficial to populations of different species. And so the four basic elements of habitat, we are calling it food, water, shelter, and nesting places or places to raise young. And this can mean different things for other species, but really it means providing native plants. So our example here is butterflies and Monica has some really great pictures of all the butterflies she's seen. Um, but you have to kind of know more about what butterflies need in order to take a holistic approach of giving them habitat and really covering those four basics of water, shelter, uh, places to raise young and everything like that. So if we look at the life cycle of a painted lady, gosh, so pretty, um, we need to know, you know, what are going to be some of the host plants for this species and what its full life cycle likes to really bring that holistic and offer as much as we can for all various stages of its life cycle. So host plants. For butterflies, a host plant is a plant that they can lay eggs on. And then when the eggs hatch and the larvae are needing to grow and build up strength, they are going to be consuming that plant. Um, sometimes it's, you know, stinging nettle for one species or another, but each species has kind of like a sweet, a small spectrum of host plants that it can really use for laying eggs and then those eggs will be able to eat that plant as well. So food and water for butterflies, you know, butterflies you think of going flower to flower and sometimes they're just haphazardly flying and you're like, does this butterfly even know what it's doing? Um, it does, yes. So they will examine things like feces, blood, um, gore even sometimes, and they're really trying to extract those nutrients that are really beneficial to them. So um, minerals, amino acids, sodium, and glucose specifically if they're trying to um, drink blood, which is just really beneficial because they need all these, all these minerals and nutrients in order to really fulfill their life cycle. So I will take over and talk about, um, Sarah referred to the foundation of habitat as being plants. Um, there, obviously, we have a whole feeder industry, and that feeder industry will sell you lots of stuff to be able to feed. You can even buy houses and things like that. But actually, plants can make some of the healthiest habitat and the easiest to maintain. Um, 
So plants actually provide all habitat elements for a lot of different species. Sarah talked about butterflies as an example where they need a host plant. Um, they can also do something for you. You can get a rich look for wherever you live. I worked with a, an apartment building in Bellingham and they all ended up putting hummingbird gardens on their balconies. And they had hummingbirds all along the side of the building going up and down is really great. So you can have even a small space and create habitat and then ma it makes it very pretty for you as well. The one thing I'll give you as a tip, and I'm going to credit David Selk from Woodland Park Zoo for this one. Um, David said, you can always borrow your neighbor's plants, right? So I'm going to talk about having a complex group of plants. Well, you don't need to have them all in your yard because your wildlife in your area is not looking at your property maps and saying, oh, I can only stay within these boundaries. They'll use the whole area. And in fact, we'll talk about how you can inspire your neighbors so that you can make a larger and larger area of habitat. So we will emphasize using native plants and we're not saying non-native plants are terrible. We'll talk about that, but why would this be? So this is a recent study that was published in the Smithsonian Magazine. And what they found is that bird populations are declining in suburban yards, even when people have a green landscape and they're using kind of natural yard care practices. And why would this be? Well, it turns out that non-native plants don't host the same insects that native plants host, right? So Sarah was talking about the need for sort of complex nutrients. Insects, we don't eat them. We don't like them, but they have a lot of fat and protein, and they're really critical, especially for birds, to feed their young, right? So it's really necessary, even when I have things like kestrels that will eat other birds, they actually will eat a lot of grasshoppers as well. Um, and so it turns out that if you have about 70% native plants, right, you can have a pretty healthy population. So that's why you see us emphasizing having native plants. Most people are, because we have a sort of morphing definition of what native is, and we talked about this in the last class, if you want to watch the video, um, what we consider in the US is plants that were brought in before European settlement. Okay, so anything afterward would be non-native. And we did talk about things like native ours in the next last talk. So if you have any interest, you can look at the video. So one of the first things you really want to do is look at your yard as it is now, right? So I have two giant rhododendrons right at my house where they should not be planted. They're probably, I'm gonna say 40, 50 years old. They're great bee plants. So I do keep them there even though they should move because they're great bee plants. Are they gonna be invasive? No, they aren't. Do they take a lot of water? Actually, no, they don't. Um, so when I have that 30% that's not native, I'm always looking at its wildlife value. And whether it's drought tolerant, whether it's going to get invasive, um, my tip to you is if your neighbor tries to give you something and says, this is all over my yard, don't take it. It's going to be invasive. Um, so kind of look at what you have already. What you have may not necessarily be a bad thing. But what you do want to do is replace invasive plants, right? So in this area, holly is horrific. Um, I get a lot of cedar waxwings and the cedar waxwings at first were going after holly trees. I was actually at a native plant uh, pickup. I was in the pickup line for the conservation district waiting for my order. And I was talking to a woman going, I got to get rid of a holly tree. And she said, oh, is it a white trunked holly? And I said, yes. She said, my husband's a boat builder. He'll come get it. And he did. Um, so I got rid of that. And then I planted our native Oregon grape, which you see on the left. Um, and they're perfectly happy with that and other berries. So you want to replace stuff that's going to end up being kind of invasive. What you're trying to replace is natural layers that we used to have. The nice thing about layering is, again, it makes your yard look a lot more complex. The other thing that it does is you can build up instead of out. So you're going to have a finite uh, property going side to side, but going up, you can actually get some height in there. 
So I'll give a quick example. Um, so if you think about it, our old landscapes had a lot of little niches from low to high for everything from amphibians and reptiles, insects, you know, birds. We've lost a lot of that, especially with trees. We've taken down trees and a lot of our cavity nesters, you see our pileated woodpecker on the left, our northern flicker on the right, are really struggle to find homes. Um, and then our bald eagles even are, they used to nest in evergreen trees and now they're kind of nesting in cottonwoods because that's all they've got left. And so getting in some of those layers, you're gonna get a lot of complexity. An adult evergreen tree can carry several hundred species of uh, insects and those insects can be very nutritious as we said for a lot of different creatures. In your layers, one of the things you'll want to think about is edge habitat. So the tendency here is to have like the square lawn, and then you have the bay laurel hedge and the one camellia or rhodi, and I call that the Ikea yard. Um, and you actually want to have some flow outward so that there's an edge where your frogs can kind of go creep along. You'll find this is a hummingbird on the upper right, feeding on nectar from a hosta that's on an edge. Again, it's my 30% of non native plants. We have a lot of local heath family flowers that like salal and evergreen huckleberry that provide nectar and berries. But you'll find a lot of uh, animals that like to use edge habitat and they'll kind of creep along in this low growing stuff. So I'll talk, I'll walk through hummingbirds. Um, we have people from across the country and outside the country. So you may have different hummingbirds. Our primary ones are our Anna's hummingbird on the left and the Rufus hummingbird on the right. So we have a lot of native and non-native low growing hummingbird flowers that you can get. Um, bee balm uh, is one of them, it's in the upper right. And we have our native red columbine, uh, The Red bee balm is also, I haven't found it to be invasive at all, and it's a good late season hummingbird flower, kind of nasty smelling, so it's not there for fragrance. Uh, the penstemons and lupins here are native um, and quite pretty, so they're really lovely to have around. Hookera is actually coral bells. We have native and non-native species. Again, they tend not to be invasive. Our fringe cup, there's a lot of low-growing plants that you can get for both sun and shade that will help hummingbirds. Red flowering currant is one of our best hummingbird shrubs. It's going to come into bloom soon and it will bloom for a long time. Really lovely plant. Um, currants are eaten by uh, cedar waxwings afterward. It is the plant that hummingbirds use to migrate north from Mexico um, coming up to our area. So as it starts to bloom south, they'll start to move north. Um, so really a nice plant to have around and very lovely in an ornamental garden. There are other shrubs like our red huckleberry is actually a great hummingbird plant and it grows in very shady woody areas. Salmonberry, you don't have to have a big wetland to have salmonberry. You can grow it in pots and it will actually grow dry and behave a lot better. Great hummingbird plant as well. And on the lower right is our snowberry. So for any species, as Sarah was talking about butterflies, knowing what that species is and then trying to pick you know, plants and habitat that works for them is, is a really good idea. So going up our layers, we have climbing. So they're not wisterias, um, which can get really invasive here. They're actually native honeysuckle families. So we have twinberry, orange trumpet honeysuckle. We have a hairy honeysuckle, which is also quite pretty and very, very popular hummingbird plants. So there's another layer for your hummingbirds. Hummingbirds actually use trees. They nest in them. They build teeny tiny little nests, um, but they also like to kind of stake their territory in them. You'll find, especially rufous hummingbirds, they'll sit high at the top and then, you know, make a lot of noise and do these big aerial dives just to kind of, you know, say, this is my place. I have them where they literally will stake out a red flowering currant shrub and then sit on a tree nearby and just guard that shrub. So that gives you an example of what layering looks like. Like I said, we did a native plant talk. There's a ton of references online that are also in that talk where you can find plants that work for whatever species you're trying to attract to your yard. So I'm gonna turn it over to Sarah to talk about pollinators and other beneficial insects.
Oh, I love those little Rufus hummingbirds. Every spring, I just get excited to see them again. I just wait for that little buzzing sound. They sound just like a large bee flying about. So maybe keep your ear tuned out for that when spring hits again. All right, so dragonflies, other beneficial insects are gonna really help keep some of the insects you don't want eating your plants at bay. Um, so we're gonna start with bees. Bees are great. They're coming in all shapes and sizes um, and really, really enjoy um, obviously flowers, but they also need bunch grasses as well. You know, we always want to think about, oh, we need flowers for pollinators. We need a lot of other plants for pollinators too. Grasses are super important for bees. Um, even in going into something that's non-native, you know, lavender is a great one for bees. We can really incorporate some of that 30% of non-native to really be aimed towards pollinators or whatever specific group of uh, wildlife that you want to attract to your yard. So it's really individual what your preference is. If you are just a pollinator lover, you're going to really go for those herbaceous species. But if you're a bird lover, you might have a mix of things, you know, trees, shrubs, and some of these um, herbaceous plants as well. Um, but bees are really important and they are just uh, wonderful to have about and you know shrubs are also very beneficial to pollinators um, and whether or not that you know you have something that's in your yard that's you know not quite native but you can also identify that it's not invasive as well so it's really making those those decisions of what to remove and replace or you know what you can keep like Monica was saying earlier that's you know benefiting wildlife, but also not um, just not being invasive and, you know, degrading uh, the landscape as well. And another consideration is really blooming time. So looking at phenology, when are things starting to bloom? Do you have a wide spectrum of something that's early blooming and really keeping it um, throughout the fall? So goldenrod, uh, Canada goldenrod is a really great one for like a late fall bloomer and then early ones as well like lupin's great and uh, I think Henderson's checker mellows pictured there as well. So we're looking at color, shape and size um, and offering a diversity of flowers to all of these different types of pollinators. Um, and so the bunch grasses will also just be important for bees more so in terms of finding nests in the ground, um, but phenology is one to keep in mind. And then I, I think I learned this just a few years ago is the picture on the bottom is a ladybug larvae. Um, it's really important to kind of think about what you see and then if you can identify it. If it's something unfamiliar to you, try to take a picture. Um, I know Google images, if you can upload a photo, sometimes you can have some success in identifying something, but it's really, you know, just being able to take time to do the research um, and just learning what things look like as young and, you know, if they have different life cycles, you know, being able to identify um, some of those stages. Ah, this is a really beautiful woodland skipper on a sea blush. And so something that Monica was saying to me before was that she had this really mowed area and being able to let it grow and you know keep something unmowed. You have rough grasses, which are really important to some um, butterfly species as well. And also um, just other insects, other small mammals, and um, you know, 96% of terrestrial birds feed insects to their young, even if they don't eat insects as an adult. So really having areas that aren't manicured and keeping them rough and wild and natural as much as we can if your space allows um, and if you don't have young kiddos who, you know, need those manicure types of landscapes. Ah, and we are going to move into food. So another critical element is really offering food. And so we're not saying like, 
leave out a huge bowl of peanuts for the Stellar's Jays, that might not be too beneficial. Um, but we're going to talk about native plants again. So some of the natural food sources that we can offer to wildlife, especially birds, is fruits, berries. So you can see the cedar waxwing here. It's eating um, some of the fruits on a Pacific crab apple. And then, you know, when we are looking at what's already in our landscape and what's in our yards, if you can identify um, some of the ornamentals that might not be native, I would just implore you to look and do some research and see, you know, are these berries toxic? Um, one of the plants that I recommend to people to replace is heavenly bamboo. Um, it's beautiful. It's an evergreen. It has fall color. It's really a lovely plant, but unfortunately its berries are pretty toxic to wildlife. And this is really important when you're thinking about cedar wax wings who eat and consume a lot of fruit and berries at once. And so there's been a lot of reports of cedar wax wings dying from eating heavily bamboo berries. So it's one of those considerations we ask you to take. Oh, and beautiful color. Oh gosh, berries in the winter. Yeah, being able to have strategic and knowing when things are blooming and when fruit and other berries will be available to wildlife is something you can plan for. And um, it's all about doing that little research of when is this going to be blooming and then when do the berries come and when are they ripe for birds. Um, and sometimes I have to battle the birds from some of my raspberries and salal in the backyard. So if you're also interested in the fruit and berries, you got to battle the birds first. Yeah, so having birds and other wildlife being able to forage naturally through the year. Um, it's an important aspect and we can supplement diets with using feeders, but in terms of feeding, which we'll get into, um, forage naturally is really the way we want to go. So, you know, got the little black, black cat chickadee here. It's gleaning, it's looking for insects, finding seeds, and they will really um, be able to search and congregate together um, in smaller flocks and then find food sources. So it's something that we need to also let them do and we can help occasionally and we can talk about when the right time would help would be. Um, so this is an Oriole and I believe it is a, is it a hooded Oriole, Monica? It's a Bullock's Oriole. A Bullock's Oriole, gosh, I can never remember which one we have here. Um, it's like almost the one of the only Orioles we have on this side of Western Washington, I believe, from this area. <laughs> But it's really, it's using this poison hemlock, which is not a plant that we want you to nurture on your property because it's toxic, um, but it has uses, right? So you see this oriole eating the nectar and really utilizing the part of the plant that it can. And then insects, we have this western wood peewee, and I believe this is a hairy woodpecker. So insects are a really important part of a bird and other wildlife's life cycle. Um, they really need it when they get here from migration and before they also go um, and migrate back down south or depending on you know where they were. But it's if we can you know have native landscapes and have native plants, it's really going to attract those insects that, that they need. Um, so whether they're eating them from a tree or you might see this wood peewee sally out from a tree, catch something and go back to the same spot. It's beautiful to see and you just can appreciate like, I hope you're eating all those mosquitoes out there because during summer at nighttime, they love me and I swell up so bad. I just need all the bats, all the swallows. I need all the birds here to help me with these mosquitoes. <laughs> I don't wanna get mosquito bites anymore. <laughs> And then, you know, the early bird gets the worm, right? So we're familiar that robins um, can hear and feel worms in the ground, which is crazy. Like, robin isn't my most favorite bird, the American robin, but I just really have to appreciate its ability um, to see and feel things that others can't do. 
Um, so when we're talking about soil food, it's those invertebrates, it's those worms. We want those areas to be healthy and we won't want those insects and invertebrates to be um, contaminated with any pesticides or herbicides. And so that's really an important factor that we want to take that holistic approach. I might just use the word holistic one too many times during this, but it's really just, it's an all encompassing, right? We want, we want you to think about all the various elements um, of the food web and how that affects the bigger picture um, in terms of wildlife and supporting uh, different species populations around us. So some of these food considerations. So when should you feed? Um, Definitely hummingbird feeders can be encouraged during really cold days. I would say bring your hummingbird feeder in at night. If it is freezing, we don't want um, it to freeze and then the thaw that is not great for hummingbirds, but during those really extreme weather events, right? Um, our Anna's hummingbird is here year round and that's the only hummingbird that we have the year round. And so you will see them during the winter and they will be aggressive around feeders too. Even though it's not breeding season, they're still, like Monica said, extremely territorial. Um, so we'll be fighting over those. And then, you know, having the thoughtfulness and consideration of when to be feeding birds. And, as we've seen, sometimes it's not always the best thing to be feeding birds. Um, I have been feeding birds up until recently. We just had this article come out from Washington Fish and Wildlife asking people not to feed birds and to take down your feeders at least, uh, this was like a month ago, but they're asking for at least like two to three weeks, which was the beginning of February because they've been seeing a lot of transmission of diseases. Um, I had found a few dead pine siskins in my yard and you can also report that as well. So if you go to Washington Fish and Wildlife, you may be able to find a link to report that, but it's really just attracting unwanted pests. Um, I'm going to use another analogy from Monica because she has the best ones, but she said that imagine if a college student was sick and they're in a dorm and they all order pizza and they're all, you know, this one college student sick, but there's a group, group of them around the pizza box eating the pizza, right? That one sick college student is going to get to get the other one sick as well. So we are seeing this with birds congregating together. There's so many more. The density of birds that are at feeders is not natural. Um, and so that's part of the problem. They're just easily able to spread those diseases and it's really harming our local populations of wildlife. So attracting predators too. You might see a sharp shinned hawk or a cooper's hawk coming and stalking feeders. Um, birds don't naturally congregate like that. So it's, it's really just not the natural like web of life, the cycle of life that you think about. Um, it's, it's just not helpful. So we're just asking folks to have these, you know, careful considerations for what you're doing. I will take back over to talk about water, um, offering water to wildlife. In our area, we are so soggy. I think London probably shares that kind of gloomy, soggy winter with us. Um, it seems like you shouldn't have to offer water. You actually do. And remember I talked about how we've lost a lot of things in our area. Actually open water that's clean and is fresh water is one of those things. Um, so what happened to all our water? As we were building our area, we actually undergrounded a whole bunch of streams and creeks and put them in pipes. This is Thornton Creek and there was a nature conservancy project there to daylight part of Thornton Creek. On, for those of you who are neighbors to Brightwater, there is a daylighted creek now at Brightwater. It used to run underground. So we also have drained a lot of wetlands um, to build housing developments, strip malls. You know, we've developed on a lot of the land that used to have water. So if it's not running underground, it's running in a storm pipe. 
not as a creek, but just literally as runoff from parking lots and stuff. So we have fewer sources of water and some of the sources of water are not super healthy. Anybody who's looked at our streets after the first heavy rain in the fall can see the rainbow sheen of oil and hydrocarbons coming off of it. So actually, you know, drinking off the street is not really a great thing for our wildlife either. So we do want to bring water back for wildlife, and there's a number of ways that you can do it. Um, if you happen to have a natural feature near you, you don't necessarily have to supplement. Take up the time and have to maintain the feeders, because you do have to maintain uh, both feeders and waterers. Um, so look around you and see if you have anything. Um, there are people who construct ponds, and you know you may need, if you're uh, creating, like diverting a stream, you definitely need permits, but sometimes you can make little backyard ponds, just going to your hardware store and getting supplies. You can also do bird baths and then small dishes. So again, you have to start thinking about the diversity of wildlife. Um, butterflies, what they need for water is going to be a shallow pan and some rocks and gravel with just a little bit of water. They can't get down into a bird feeder, right? Um, so you're going to have to think about what is the diversity of wildlife I have? And then there's a lot of stuff online for tips of good um, watering uh, systems for them. The things you're going to want to be careful about is that if you're going to offer water, make sure it's there consistently, right? So if you're going to go on vacation and you have wildlife in your yard and they're expecting water, do not let it dry up, especially wildlife like butterflies. They have like nowhere else to go. It's not like they can fly 50 miles to get a drink and come back again, right? You do have to think about cleaning water features. We're pretty mossy here. I saw we have somebody from the Southwest. I don't know if you get the same issues we do. Um, as Sarah and I were laughing about this. I put out what I thought were amphibian water dishes and then the crows found it and they kept washing like parts of animals they were eating in it. It was disgusting. So they, I had to really clean them. And then I ended up just giving up on them because I live by a river. I thought, well, the crows can figure it out on their own. Um, one of the things that we see a lot here, I'm not sure if everybody on this call does, but one of the things we actually see is they sell a lot of glazed pottery type uh, water baths and these are really slick so you know how it is with our bathtubs it's like you end up putting the little dots down on the bathtub so you don't kill yourself getting into the bathtub or shower you really need some rough surface for birds and stuff so they aren't like sliding around on this um, and then you may need for smaller birds or butterflies, uh, dragonflies like rocks. So you're actually making like a shallow pond type thing, even if it's in a surface water bath, like the one you see in this photograph. So I'm gonna turn it back over to uh, Sarah to talk about hardscape. We've gotten through food, uh, water, um, let's go to hardscape. Yeah, so as Monica has been saying throughout the presentation, you know, we have drastically altered and changed our land that was once previously here. Um, and to really combat some of that, some of the loss of structure, which, you know, could have been like dead trees, some snags and everything else is to really buy and or create um, structure that was once lost. So this can be perches um, and perches are great because they just help wildlife and other things evade predators, stay alive, hunts, and being able to utilize, you know, taller ones versus smaller ones, depending on the birds and other species you're trying to attract. And Monica has this great, I think it's about 16 feet, this perch pole. I'm going to put one in my small yard. Um, my neighbors might get mad, but, you know, until they see an owl up there, they won't be angry after that. Um, but as you can see, raptors, other species would really utilize this space to hunt. And if you have an issue with voles or other rodents around your property, put up a perching pole. Um, it is going to really help birds be able to spot those rodents, just another place for them to rest and really um, being able to identify like what's around here. And you could see like a cute little American kestrel um, who have 
a UV vision to some degree. So mice, their pee, you can see under UV light and Kestrels will use that um, to identify like where mice are feeding and where they're peeing to really go down and get them as well. Um, other structures are fencing and posts. So you can see this Cooper's hawk. Um, it's sunning, it's getting dry, it may have just rained. Um, but regardless of how tall or what the structure looks like, there could always be wildlife who are just using it um, to sun out, to dry, to hunt. You can see this barn owl down here on the fence post. And um, to me, having these encounters and experiences with wildlife is really what it's all about. Not only do I care about them, but being able to see them is something I can really appreciate. And it makes me feel good. Like, oh, I'm doing something good for wildlife here. Like, look at me. Um, and we want everyone to have that same feeling. So please utilize spaces um, and really if you are providing structures for wildlife please make them as safe and um, natural as they can be as well uh, just to make sure there's no chemicals or anything else that will hurt them um, rockery so you can either pile rocks or use them as landscaping features and this is great for amphibians and reptiles alike um, being able to sun out on them rocks will stay warm, it's places to hunt, it's places to hide. And, you know, a lot of amphibians and reptiles will just utilize these spaces um, during the day or at night, but it's really beneficial. The small nooks and crannies are kind of what wildlife need to stay covered, stay hidden until it's safe for them to come out. Ah, leaving the logs. So these pictures are from my house and I, salvaged and utilized a bunch of logs that were cut down. So instead of having like rocks or cement blocks, I decided to utilize just dead logs and I wish they were standing up actually. Like if I could make a perch with a bunch of tall dead logs, that'd be amazing because I want a little tiny owl to nest in it. And that's just been my life list of, I need to see little tiny owls, um, but it's really great great spaces and cover for salamanders. So we have a long-toed salamander up top and then down below is that Incitina. Um, and then I had a pileated woodpecker come into my yard. I've never seen one so close to the ground, but it makes sense that the logs are on the ground and it's just been chopping, pecking, drumming away at these logs, which is really cool to see. So I'm just interested and in, you know, never expected some of these animals to be so close to the ground. But when you have habitat like this and um, sources of food, they will come and you know, whether we're all home now, so hopefully we're seeing more wildlife around our properties and being able to identify like hot spots where you see either like a lot of insects or a lot of birds or going into an area that you know, maybe doesn't have that much activity. So um, one of the things we want to provide, we talked about nest sites, so um, shelter and perches are really important. If you think about the life cycle of our wildlife, they're really important for them to actually find their friends, find food sources, find mates, um, have children, bring their children around, right? But they actually, to even get that far, they need to have nest sites. So this is a Pacific Slope flycatcher. We have a lot of what are called cavity nesters here that have no homes anymore. Um, we've taken down a lot of our trees. And so um, putting trees up is great. Having woodpeckers poke holes in them is actually great because a lot of other animals will use those holes holes, but we can also create sites on our own. This is actually my meter box, which isn't the best place. So I put out a bird box, nesting box for the specific slope flycatcher that's right by this. Um, but we'll talk about tree cavities, thickets, burrows in the ground. Um, Sarah talked about logs are great, leaf litter, and uh, shrubs and trees. 
So one of the big take homes I always have for people is please don't get too tidy in your yard in the fall. You know how we do the fall cleanup and you clean up all your leaves and then you ship them out to the yard waste and they compost them. You just composted next season's butterflies because most of our butterflies overwinter as chrysalids in leaf litter. So I know somebody who is actually collecting other people's leaf litter. Um, if you have diseased trees, don't do this. In fact, probably get rid of that tree. But if your trees are healthy, you can take your leaf litter. If you live in um, a homeowners association or a housing development that has covenants, one of the things you can do is lay it out in your beds neatly and then put a thin, thin layer of bark mulch over the top. So then it looks all tidy, but you've kept your leaf litter in place. I often keep dead leaves in the upper right is our Oregon uh, iris, which is really beautiful in season, great for erosion control, um, super hardy. But what they do is the leaves fall over in the wintertime. It's really great for both stuff living underneath, right, amphibians and frogs and stuff. And then it also holds the soil down so that all around that circle, you're not getting A weeds or B soil erosion when the rain starts um, pounding. So there's a lot you can do um, to save like materials in your yard that you may not realize is where your next generation, your nesting sites. So I'll turn it over to Sarah to talk about actually building nesting habitat. She's talked about creating it with things like rockeries and stuff, and she'll talk about building it. Yeah, so we could really go into utilizing nest boxes that we build, insect houses, um, but there are some considerations we need to think about when we're placing them and um, having them in our yard. So more importantly for pollinators and bees and other insects where you can build these cute little insect hotels, oh, they get me so excited. Um, but really we need to make sure that um, they're cleaned each year. Um, and that's sometimes not easy depending on what it looks like, but also making sure that a lot of the holes are deep enough because if something's not deep enough, you know, a woodpecker can just get in there and um, really destroy all the larvae, whether it's like a mason bee or anything else. And then if you are, you know, attracting mason bees, make sure to have some bare ground exposed so that they can also fill in that little cavity that they're going to be nesting in. Yes, yeah, so about 70% of our native bees in Washington are ground nesting. So the other 30% are cavity nesting or they also nest in stems, which you know can be like a bigger cavity. So this cool graphic came from Xerxes. Um, it is great because it really gives us that detailed information of when to cut back spent flower heads. Um, so it's the spring, but I just, I'm visual learner. So this graphic to me was really helpful of, you know, when to cut those off and how to be able to identify um, either what's nesting in there or just the evidence that something is nesting in there. So I just thought that was a really cool graphic and wanted to share it with you all. So hedgerows and thickets as well. This is a great natural fence, but it also provides so much food and protection for wildlife. Um, protection from predators, it's great nesting habitat as well. And if you're able to incorporate different species into your hedgerow and have enough space for it to build in, it's really going to be longer lasting. It's going to be healthier. Sometimes when folks do a monoculture, um, disease can infiltrate one species and then spread throughout all of them. So incorporating having a diversity will bring different insects, it will bring different wildlife and, you know, diversity, 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 you know, have different plants and make sure that you have enough spacing and that there's just enough breathability as well with hedgerows and thickets. Yeah, and if you're from Western Washington, um, we have two of the ugliest species for a hedge, our bay laurel and uh, arbor vitae. I mean, <laughs> it's just like, they're bad for wildlife and really boring. And yeah, they're just not providing those elements, right, for as native plants do. And then another consideration is nesting material. Folks want to help, and I don't blame them, they want to help little cute hummingbirds have great little 
cozy nest for their babies. Um, but sometimes the nesting material that folks leave out isn't great. So we want to avoid things like string. Um, dryer lint is terrible because it just has a bunch of synthetic fabrics um, made with plastic. You know, fleece isn't great either. So this is a Oriole nest and Monica stated that it's entirely made out of plastic, which is not great. And, you know, having those considerations for what would things be made out of before we had all these synthetic materials. And that's, you know, things like hair, you know, maybe if you're, if you're not treating your dog for fleas, um, topically, you know, brush your dog outside, like give your dog a blowout, let it just have all of its hair outside and maybe it'll just like float around and some birds will find it. Um, but just those careful considerations of what you're offering to wildlife. And that will help us segue into protecting wildlife in your yard. So we're kind of um, giving an overview of how to get wildlife to your yard and have them reproduce there. But then when they get there, you actually have to protect them. Um, because our houses don't always work well in our lives for wildlife. So pest control methods are really an issue. Um, rat poison in our area is it has been a horrendous problem for raptors. So what's going to happen is you're going to put out rat poison for rodents and then all of a sudden they're going to get picked up by raptors. They could get picked up by your cat or dog. Um, believe it or not, there are 15,000 calls to the Centers for Disease Control each year because kids have gotten poisoned by rat poison. They will eat it. Um, so really being careful about how you're controlling pests, and we'll talk about pests the next time, so I don't want to go it, take too much time here to talk about it, but think about it. A lot of people are like, well, I just treat for crane fly. Crane flies are an insect, so are butterflies, and so are dragonflies and bees and other insects you may want in your yard. So you really need to think about, should I be controlling for crane fly? I got in a big war with them and then finally gave up. And I have a lot of beneficial insects, which Sarah talked about, and I have no crane fly anymore. So it's been a good thing. Uh, bird strikes on windows are a major cause of bird death. Um, there is an estimate, and obviously it's only an estimate, that a billion birds die a year from window strikes. Uh, what we're looking at in the city of Seattle, New York City has it, is bird safe window design or bird safe building design in general. We're actually, Wastewater Treatment Division is designing a building and we are going to make it bird safe. Um, because windows, if you don't break up, reflections are really problematic. And so you, now you can get actual windows where they have etching in it to prevent bird strikes. You can also get a lot of aftermarket products. So I got an aftermarket product from American Bird Conservancy. Here's the thing, it works well for me. Birds don't hit my windows. I have nice picture windows. I can see out, but guess what? People can't see in from the other side. And I kind of live in the middle of nowhere, but with COVID, more people have been out walking and accidentally walking right through my yard, which is really weird if you knew where I lived. Um, so it worked for me and it's, I have like almost zero bird strikes. So protecting from windows is a good thing. Also protecting from your pets. Um, I inherited my property with a, uh, a set of cats. I made them indoor cats. Um, this is a friend of mine. She has a cat harness. You can apparently leash train cats. I did not know that was a thing. Um, I have other friends that have catios so the cats can get out and enjoy the outdoors. I have a dog I have to be careful with. He has not so far shown wildlife aggression, but I am not sure that he wouldn't. I used to have greyhound dogs and they can be predatory. So you know, I love pets and I have them myself. Um, I don't have the cats anymore. They, they aged out, um, but it's really trying to help protect wildlife from your pets is a good thing. Um, so people saying, oh, well, my dog just brings in rats. That may not be the only thing that he's killing. Yeah, so letting nature help you. I express my need for nature to help me when it comes to mosquito season. Um, and this wren is showing us a good example of how they love to eat bugs and gosh, you know, garter snakes will eat slugs, salamanders will eat slugs, you know, 
dragonflies also love to just predate on other flying insects. So we have a whole team with us against all these bugs we don't necessarily want, but are also helpful to other species. So a good example of folks of a species that folks don't typically like is the bald faced hornet. Um, it's an excellent predatory insect. It really can um, decimate all of the insects that you don't always want in your yard. Um, but folks aren't always so easy about having a nest right by their house or being able to like house and really appreciate these species. Um, lacewing is another example of a great predatory insect. So all of these are able to, especially if you have a garden, they're great for just keeping some of these unwanted pests away. Another consideration is just for the small little amphibians, whether it's if it's a frog, toad, or salamander, or newt. Um, fun fact, all toads are frogs, but not all frogs are toads. And mm -hmm. all newts are salamanders, but not all sal salamanders are newts. So I'm gonna, we're gonna test you at the end. I'm just kidding, we're not testing you. Um, but really, so pesticide use can really affect these amphibians, especially frogs, because they absorb, um, they absorb water and other chemicals through their skin. So I'm always very careful to like wash my hands before and after uh, touching any wildlife, especially amphibians, but we really just want to keep pesticides off the ground, out of your yards and really out of our waterways because whatever you spray and use in your yard, we live in a, you know, everyone lives in some sort of watershed, no matter how big it is, you know, if it's a sub basin or looking at a larger scale picture, anything you do on your property, whether or not you live next to a stream is going to make it into the Puget Sound. So, you know, just please, um, if you have to use pesticides, follow the labels exactly and know the time that you're supposed to be spraying um, and check the weather so that you're not spraying pesticides and then it's going to do a torrential downpour as well. Another way to help reduce your use and need for any pesticide or herbicide is to get ahead of it before it becomes too much of a problem. So we see this gentleman down here. It looks like he has a big problem of morning glory and ivy behind him. That is a situation where it's really hard to manually control that. But just getting ahead of it, if you have creeping buttercup, you know, spend some time doing manual removal and also utilize wood chips. Not only are wood chips beneficial to soil because it's a slow release of nutrients and it helps collect soil moisture and keep things moist, especially if you have plants that need that moisture. It's also great and easy to lay down a bunch of wood chips, do some sheet mulching. And then when you have weeds come up, um, it's easier to pull and easier to remove and it's not super physically straining. Um, so that's a great tactic that we um, implore you all to use. Wood chips are just beneficial, um, not only for, you know, keeping down unwanted weeds, but also providing food and habitat for insects and other wildlife. So we'll switch gears now and talk about some resources. We want to leave some time for questions. So I will kind of breeze through this. Um, it's landscaping for wildlife is one of those things where you could literally go on for a three day workshop about it um, to get people really oriented. So we have an overview, but there are lots and lots of resources available to you. Um, the one thing you can do is look at certifying your yard. Um, so there are a lot of resources available through uh, National Wildlife Foundation and we'll, or Federation, and we'll have a link to that. And then uh, the state of Washington, if you did not know, Fish and Wildlife started the first backyard wildlife sanctuary program in the nation. So we started the whole concept. Um, I like to get certified at both. I didn't do it earlier because I lived in a farming area where it would have made me highly unpopular and a bit of a target. But at this point, uh, we have changed over to a new way of thinking in our area. And so getting certified actually helps to inspire other people in your neighborhood. And like I said, 
wildlife doesn't know your property boundary, if you can expand and inspire your neighbors, you can end up with a lot more habitat and a lot more variety. So for Western Washington, we have two really excellent uh, local references. You can still get them from Amazon, I think. Um, I saw them both for sale. You used to be able to buy them at Fish and Wildlife in Mill Creek. So Russell Link was a landscape architect who became an urban habitat biologist for Fish and Wildlife. He is the person who started the Backyard Sanctuary Program. So they have all sorts of practical tips in landscaping for wildlife about layering. There's great diagrams. There's like nest construction, um, things, nest box construction, bat houses, all sorts of really practical information. The lovely thing is because he was a landscape architect, he really has a landscape architect sensibility. So for those of you who are worried about the appearance of your property, you know, or you live in a homeowners association, it's great to get those aesthetics in there as well. I'll talk about this more in the pest class as well, but living with wildlife is a really helpful guide to, first of all, our local wildlife and their needs, but also making sure that they don't, our local wildlife like this raccoon, doesn't become a pest on your property. Uh, they still have a habitat at home. There's a link on this slide and everybody will get the slides as Kristen mentioned. So um, you can find a lot of resources on this. It's not as rich as it used to be, but there's still a lot of information that's available there. Um, and then am I, uh, this is the Washington Butterfly Association. We talked about the host plants that are needed for butterflies. There's a ton of, this is where I go for all my information. You can actually go on tours with them, which is really kind of fun. Um, but they have a lot of gardening tips and best plants. Um, and I'm gonna switch over to Sarah now. Yeah, so Snohomish Conservation District, the organization I work for, um, has some great resources. So we have, um, you know, resources and, um, sorry, fact sheets for planting for birds, um, slope erosion, you know, it's not just habitat and wildlife, but also some better management practices practices for any issues you're experiencing on your property. Um, so we have a great, you know, native and non-native guide to, you know, Plants are great for bees, and of course, always talking about birds because a lot of us are bird lovers at the district, mm -hmm. but also, you know, have considerations for other wildlife. <laughs> yeah, and so Xerxes Society has a great habitat assessment, um, and they do have some other pollinator resources and bee resources available for download um, and other great graphics, which has helped kind of. Um, build your awareness and education of some of the things to offering, you know, like plant, planting the same flower species in clumps for bees. It's just those small nuance, um, you know, tactics that some of us aren't too familiar with. And um, it's just really helpful to know. So if you're interested in that, please download one. And then this native plant finder, this is great because it will help you decide based on soil texture, your soil moisture, sunlight availability, um, what native plants in our area are gonna be the best for your property. So I would suggest that you utilize that and then find a conservation district having a native plant cell near you. <laughs> and then some of the great um, apps and websites I use our eBird, Bumblebee Watch, these are all the citizen science you can collect um, and report the species you're finding. I like iNaturalist a lot because not only is it about wildlife, but you can also um, report any really cool plant species, whether if it's highly invasive um, or just a rare plant that you found. So these are all great resources for really Use, using citizen science and having a big um, compiling lots of data so and being able to use it for scientific research. And I think with that, um, we've given you, like I said, a kind of a sweeping overview, but we've got some time for questions. I know Kristen has been compiling them. And thank you, Kristen. I thought we were going to be able to 
alternate an answer, but then you're listening to the other person and I'm navigating slides. So sorry about that. A lot we to thought we were going to be more active. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. I have a whole list. Um, <laughs> let's see. We can start maybe towards the beginning. Somebody was wondering, um, is Japanese Barbary something that should be replaced? So Barbary on the East Coast of the United States is horrifically invasive. Um, I'll just tell you that. Uh, it has not been as much on the West Coast. Does it provide a lot of wildlife value? Actually not. There are natives you could replace it with that also will have some fall color. Um, but it has not been as invasive here. The East Coast, it's just horrific. So it's something that you'll want to think about. Um, you know, you can replace it, it won't invade, but do you really want to take up real estate for something that doesn't have a lot of wildlife value if that's what your goal is? Awesome, thanks. And then um, someone was also wondering, do you recommend putting some soil in the water source so butterflies can get their mineral requirements? It's not so much soil. So it's usually what they're looking at is a gravel. Um, and so what I used to do, because I had gravel in my horse paddocks, when I would dump out their water buckets to clean them, then it would be like moist and you get all these butterflies that would land in the gravel. So it's not like organic soil so much as mineral heavy. So clays or gravels or things like that. And that's usually when you're going to make a butterfly dish and you can find those things like National Wildlife Federation has that you're going to put like any say clay planter dish and then you put a little bit of gravel and it's got some fines in it and you put some big rocks where they can sit don't put them where your birds perch because the birds will just learn to prey on butterflies but then you put a thin layer of water not deep right but a thin layer to where the gravel is moist and then you'll get puddling butterflies all right um and then Somebody was um, just struggling with the balance of wanting to leave their foliage on the ground for wildlife, but also knowing that it does tend to attract slugs. So trying to like figure out a, a balance for, you know, not having too many slugs, but providing some extra habitat. Any suggestions for that? Yeah, I saw that one come by. So one of the things, and I mentioned that also, is I plant like a lot of stuff slugs don't like in among stuff they like. The other thing, I, I somehow or another have to figure out how to show this video. I keep telling Kristen, it was my most popular tweet ever. I caught a garter snake coming across my yard at about 90 miles an hour with a slug in its mouth, really encouraging um, predators of slugs, opossums eat a lot of slugs during the summer. If you didn't know that, if you're in the South, they're eating ticks, so good thing. Um, so if you can get other wildlife, that's what Sarah was talking about, having nature kind of work for you, um, that can help. I actually don't have a slug problem, believe it or not. I live in Western Washington, but it is because I've started using sort of companion plantings with things they don't like and really encouraging other things that eat slugs. Okay, um, and then maybe this would be a good one for Sarah. Um, someone purchased some beef eaters at Costco and they're wondering if those are good and if yes, when should they place them out for, for the bees or pollinators? Ooh, Monica, I don't have much knowledge. I haven't seen bee feeders before, have you? No, I have not. Uh, yeah, I have a, a a bee feeder? Yeah, no. I Some of those things, and I'll tell you at Costco, like the butterfly houses that they have, like I butterflies don't usually use them, wasps do. <laughs> I mean, it, I didn't mean to disrespect the industry that's making a lot of money off these things, but I would just get plants, even if they're in pots. We showed like the sea thrift and stuff and things like that. You can make great little pots and do things like that. So I can't really say because I've never actually heard of this before. Okay. <laughs> I saw that they're, um, this individual said that they're bee houses. So uh, mason bee houses. Okay. So mason bee houses are great. Um, I would, I would say make sure there's exposed soil, um, do research and I can't remember off the top of my head, but there should be a certain depth of how deep the hole goes to make sure that the larvae aren't predated upon. Um, and then making sure that they're cleaned as much as you can after the larvae leave and hatch. Um, but mason bee houses are, are great. 
And, you know, if you're able to snags and other things that you can leave that don't compromise infrastructure, um, those are also great alternatives to, you know, having to purchase anything and just having, um, you know, wood available for cavity nesting bees and insects. Yeah, and I'm sorry, I misunderstood. I thought you said bee feeder, and I was like, bee feeder. Um, one of the things I've done, Sarah talked about keeping your logs, and so I had the previous owner planted trees right on the foundation of my house. Very bad. Uh, the last one's coming down because now it's taller than the house, and it uh, tried to tip over on the house in a windstorm. What I do is keep those logs and use them in the landscape. And then what I learned from a beekeeper is to drill holes in them. You don't even have to put the inserts in as long as you drill holes. And as Sarah said, make them deep enough so that the larvae can't get predated on. Just put them in the landscape and the bees will find them. And you know, so they're landscape logs, they're gonna break down and they're gonna provide some nutrients, keep moisture in the soil, but then you can also drill these holes in them and then they end up working for, um, for B, B places. Okay, so a couple people are, are wondering how they can attract certain wildlife. So one person has um, deer and elk nearby and they would love to know how they could help encourage them in their yard. And then somebody is really excited about your garter snake um, eating slugs <laughs> story. So <laughs> how, how can they attract garter snakes? Those yeah, two. and uh, I see people, um, Sarah's got a tip on this about not mowing. So garter snakes really need shelter. And where they live, like they hibernate between, there's a split in the concrete pad, I didn't put this in, between my barn floor and the outside. And they literally live down there in the wintertime, breed and then come back up. And I just tolerate it. I've never tried to fill that and it has an overhang so it stays dry. You can even put down plywood or logs and then they will find their way underneath. I have occasionally tried to kill whole areas with six mil black plastic. When you go in in the spring and pull it up, um, what you will find is the garter snakes, because it's warm and it's shelter, they have been actually hiding underneath and, you know, they will, you'll find all sorts of skins and stuff. So they really need shelter. I had crows move in and nest the first time last year. And unfortunately, the area by the barn, there was a perch nearby and they were able to start nabbing the garter snakes and they weren't even always eating them. They'd like grab them, kill them, and then drop them on the pad. And I'm like, dudes, don't do this. Um, you do become a wildlife manager when you attract wildlife to your yard, just a warning. But, um, but yeah, garter snakes are really, really beneficial. And so I highly encourage them. They're actually also quite pretty if you take a good look at them. They're beautiful. Yeah. And I second the plywood, the plywood, just laying it down. Also great for amphibians. Mm -hmm. um, they love just hide under dark places and stay moist. Mm -hmm. And what about attracting deer and elk besides planting a vegetable garden? <laughs> yeah, there's a lot that you can do. The one caution I would have about especially attracting elk is they can get quite aggressive. Um, especially during breeding season. Uh, generally, like I have friends in Montana and there is, if you go to Mammoth uh, at Yellowstone National Park, there is always a bull elk. A lot of the elk hang around there during the rut. And the reason they're doing it is because the tourists ward off the grizzly bears and the wolves. And so they sit on the lawns and bash cars all fall. They literally, everybody driving by and slowing down, they just boom, bash their car. So, um, I, you have to actually check the state regulations. I would look at the living with wildlife. <clears throat> you can't feed wildlife like that. It's considered baiting. Um, and so if you have, so I get deer occasionally that move through. Um, we've had fewer people who are year round hunters, which yes, it's illegal, but they do it. And so when they move through, I have a lot of things like red twig dogwood and salal that really once they're established, they don't care if they get pruned. In fact, they look prettier when they're pruned and the deer will tend to favor native plants like that rather than my garden. Okay, and then there's a question that just came in the chat from Barrett about hummingbirds. Um, what are specific reasons why we need to provide habitat for them? And then I know, Sarah, you were trying to find the answer to the, um, the nectar freezing and thawing and why that could be potentially bad for hummingbirds. I don't know if you found that answer. 
Yeah, the evidence I found was for that specific, the thawing and freezing was that it just, it you need fresh nectar and so it can spoil easily. So they just recommend switching it out afterwards. Gotcha. And um, yeah, but, now uh, somebody had asked earlier about hummingbirds and or about birds needing to provide space for birds because climate change is changing range. In fact, Audubon is starting to publish range maps where they show projected range, you know, changing because of climate change. Are Anna's hummingbirds, as Sarah mentioned, they didn't used to be here year round. Um, they are now, but it's because of climate change. I have black Phoebes, which are rare in our area, but they are also starting to move north. So hummingbirds aren't endangered, but the thing is, is all birds are on the decline. Okay. And so without being frankly endangered, providing habitat for them can keep them at healthier numbers, especially as climate change keeps coming in. Or if you have like they're having with pine siskins, it's not feeders causing the salmonella outbreak. It's pine siskins sharing it at feeders. So if you have a disease outbreak, something happens. We had West Nile virus and American crows. Having these healthy, sustainable populations can make them more resilient to natural things that go on around us. If you saw, um, I don't know if you follow bird news with the horrific wildfires we had in California this year, the number of birds that were just dropping dead out of the sky because the smoke was putting them off course and they couldn't get food and things like that. So, so even if you're not, if something's not endangered, keeping that robust population is super helpful. People tend to really also love hummingbirds. They're really pretty and their behavior is a lot of fun to watch. Oh, and they're just little jelly bean shaped eggs are the best. Yeah. Um, one thing I do want to point out is uh, Cornell Lab of Ornithology has amazing resources for birds. So I think I put the link to their website in the chat. It's all about birds.org. Um, and if you look up a specific species, if that species will use a nesting box or a platform or anything man-made, it will give you the size, height off the ground, which direction to face, um, and how big it needs to be for that particular species. So that's also really helpful if you want to um, go into that type of hardscape. And then Drew had a question about feeding hummingbirds in the fall and winter. Um, the Rufus hummingbirds just leave. The Annas are gonna stay here anyway. So Anna's hummingbirds are leading a lot, eating a lot of spiders in the winter time. I was growing dahlias for a friend um, and he was trying to come up with a new variety and he didn't want the, the experimental ones hybridizing with the stuff he was selling. So I was growing these dahlias and the hummingbirds kept uh, going to them. And the reason they were going is for aphids. Um, so they eat a lot of aphids and other insects. So you don't necessarily, Anna's will stay here without food year round. I tend to only feed when it's super icy. Like we just had this big snowstorm, and last year we had sort of protracted cold and snow. Um, but yeah, you're not going to stop them from migrating. They will migrate regardless. Okay, and then, um, sorry, I did not see this question earlier. Um, someone's asking for some suggestions of native plants that love to be wet. So like in standing water, at least like soggy um, part of the year. We have lots of them and it depends on what you have for space in your yard. So I have things, um, uh, yeah, I have so many suggestions that <laughs> all, like Mirica Gale is one of those. And so it's got a teeny kind of, it's a shrub, teeny nondescript uh, yellow flower. It's a great butterfly plant, right? Our um, twinberry will grow in wet conditions. We have a ton of stuff. It just depends on how much space you have. Like we an acre. I have an acre. Oh yeah. So if you're away from your, we talked about this in our first class, if you're away from your house and your utilities and things like that, you can get things like red as your dogwood and let it go. Uh, salmonberry loves it wet, but it will also deal with dry. One of my absolute favorites is Pacific crab apple. It has beautiful fragrant blossoms and it has not a thorn, but a spur. And so birds like to nest in it because cats and rats and stuff won't climb it because of the spurs. And then it gets fruit afterward and it will grow in very, very wet conditions. So we have a lot of native plants that will be, because we used to be fairly soggy here with a lot of wetlands. 
So, um, and you know, if what I, I second can, that black when go ahead. Sorry. Uh, black twinberry is very versatile. Then most of the willows are great. And I would suggest um, you can use it in the form or plant it in the form of a live stake. So it's just essentially a, a thick branch um, with all the other twigs cut off, but you just stick it in the ground and it grows into a shrub or tree. Uh, but Pacific willow and Sitka willow are great for that. Yeah, I have schoolers willow and it's one thing that unless I'm on nine acres, I'd not recommend for most people because it sprawls. So it's a great perching tree. It's actually more stable in the wind. All willows and poplars and aspens are great butterfly trees. Do not put them in a regular size yard. But if you're out on the acre or multiple acres like me and you can put them away from houses, they're really great butterfly trees and they have other insects that get attracted to sap on aspens. Um, paper birch is another one. I adore paper birch. You don't want it anywhere near an underground utility, but it is, first of all, a very beautiful tree. Um, and then it tends to stay polite. So the one that will spread on you is quaking aspen, another great wildlife tree, but it will clone itself and you will have quaking aspen everywhere. So don't do that unless you have huge acreage, but um, definitely paper birch is one where if you have kind of a wet area and it's distant from your house and utilities, it's a really great wildlife tree as well. And I can give, uh, Kristen's gonna send out stuff. I can give her a list of, um, of plants that might be helpful for wet conditions and for wildlife. All right, um, and this is a, a very specific question, but what brand of aftermarket window treatment did you buy, Monica? Do you remember? <laughs> yeah, I got mine as the, um, it's actually the film cover from American Bird Conservancy. They're actually a nonprofit. Um, and so you can buy it in, they will actually measure the sheets for you and it's a peel and stick. And I will tell you, I'm super clumsy and I was able to do it. I was a little bit shocked that that worked because I thought, oh great, I'm gonna peel and stick and it's gonna be cattywampus, but it actually worked pretty effectively. What I really love about it is not only, like I have no bird strikes on the windows that are covered, but I also, I have big picture windows, which I love, but I don't want to kill birds. And then in one side, I get way too much sun and it was bleaching my floor. So they actually, if you look from the outside, nobody can look inside. And then it cuts the sun just enough where it's not bleaching the floors anymore. Cause I didn't want to have picture windows and then put up drapes to protect the floors, which is like goofy. So it has a little bit of a filtration there as well. Um, but American Bird Conservancy has a really great aftermarket product. Um, and again, they're nonprofit and they, you know, they do other good work as well. Okay, so it's time to end class. So I just want to say thank you to Monica and Sarah for all of that amazing information. Um, and we have one more class left in our series. Um, which will be in two weeks from today, March 6th, on pests and nuisances in your yard. So hopefully we'll see you there. And I will be sending out this um, presentation and the resources either this weekend or Monday and um, the link to the recording probably in about a week or so. So thanks for being here and have a wonderful weekend, everyone. Bye. Thank you so much.